probably the biggest legacy of the of the space shuttle program is the International Space Station. And uh, while it orbits, sometimes people forget it's up there and what they're exactly doing. There's research labs all over the country, and uh, we don't really know what they're doing either. But um, the International Space is unique because they're doing they're able to do experiments in microgravity in this unique environment. And the next speaker, Tara Rutley, is going to tell you a little bit about what makes unique. What's some of the science that we're doing with Tara? Okay, so let's see. I'm going to need my hands because I have toys for you guys to play with and look at. Um, my name is Tara Rutley. I am the Associate Program Scientist for the Space Station. Uh, and the key word behind that is science because science is fun. Science is cool. Um, and as much as you all are geeked out to be here this week, I think I've overused the word geek out because boy, I'm, I'm super excited to be here too. Um, I've wanted to work for NASA my whole life and uh, one of the things that encouraged me to follow this path was I didn't, well, I didn't like math and science was okay, but um, I wanted to work for NASA. In fact, I actually wanted to be an astronaut, so one of our uh, high school tours was to the Johnson Space Center and we were from Louisiana. And I asked an astronaut, so what does it take to become an astronaut, and he said, just have fun. Whatever you do to get there, just enjoy what you're doing. And that changed everything, so that's what I did, and that's, that's how I ended up here. Um, so uh, I have my master's degree, well, my bachelor's in biology, my master's is mechanical engineering, and my PhD is neuroscience, and I spent the first eight years just being super lucky to go to work for NASA, um, but it was in engineering, and I was not too I didn't think I'd be too thrilled about that, but as it turned out, it was great because it was biomedical engineering. And then two years ago, I decided it was time to do something a little bit different and uh, get a taste of the science. And I looked out again because I have the coolest job at JSC. It's really fun. So anytime I get the opportunity to get people trapped in a room with four walls and just a couple doors and I can talk about space station science, I do. So I, <laughs> I'm like, I appreciate your attention. And um, when I was thinking about what to say today, uh, I thought the best way to do it was the best way to sum up the thoughts that are going on in my head if I had a chance to say anything about space station science is uh, to sum it up in the top 10 space station research things you ought to know. And to do that, I had to make a list, a cheat sheet, because otherwise I could just go off on a tangent. So um, first of all, you can find more information about space station science. That's at uh, nasa.gov forward slash ISS dash science. And we have a great website. Our office of the program scientist the, for space station has a blog and it's called a lab a lot. And that's go.usa.gov forward slash ATL. Or you can go to nasa.gov and look it up. And of course on Twitter, we are at ISS underscore research. And you all know how fabulous Twitter is. So here we go. Top 10 uh, coolest, coolest factors of space station research. First of all, the big message is the space station is human exploration of space. Don't forget it. Yes, shuttle's ending, and we have a little bit of changes going on with the Constellation program. But like, like John said, don't forget, station's up there. It is human exploration of space. We have folks up there. And its purpose is as an orbiting laboratory. They do research, and when you think about the research, why do you do that? Well, as you heard before, it's to advance things like just basic discovery, textbook knowledge. We, you know, that moves us forwards. Um, we want to enable Earth benefits, right? Give back to the folks down here, and uh, we want to further human exploration of space. So the research that we do up there focuses focuses on either one or all three of those things. And anytime you can have an investigation that encompasses all three of those things. You're maximizing the use of space station for its scientific potential. So look for those three things. Um, uh, just to give you some stats that I had to write down, because my brain can't hold all the numbers, because they're pretty amazing. Our current crew, Expedition 27, and our next crew, Expedition 28, uh, will operate over 115 experiments representing NASA and our international partners. Uh, there are nearly 30 facilities on orbit right now dedicated to to research solely, and they have supported over 1,100 investigations representing over 900 scientists in over 60 different countries. This is over just the last 10 years that the station's been on orbit, and that was its assembly period. That was like 
that was like building a vehicle. Oh, by the way, we have a little bit of time for research. And all these numbers represent only 20% of the entire research plan for space station. That's, that's massive already. So through 2020, we have plenty more to go. It's pretty amazing. That was number 10. Number nine. <laughs> In 2005, NASA, uh, well, the U.S. Congress designated, uh, designated the U.S. assets of the space station as a national laboratory. You know, you've heard about this, not quite sure what it means, but basically what it means is that um, while NASA's research goals are centered around human exploration of space, the National Lab Office research goals are centered around benefiting those on Earth and benefiting the public. And, and the National Lab Office uses NASA resources, NASA allocations on orbit, and launch resources to integrate those research experiments that are actually funded and provided through partners of the National Lab Office. Places like the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the USDA, they all have, they all have memorandums of agreements with NASA. And in fact, the, the NIH uh, just recently funded over $1.3 million of their own research money for three different proposals that are going to use the space station as a way to further advance their missions, right? Osteoporosis, cancer, and aging research. So that's the National Lab Office. Um, and so you may have heard a little bit about that. I've heard a little bit of that up. Um, number eight, our office often gets the question, look, ISS is fully assembled now, that's great, now you can do your research, but how are you supposed to get research up and samples down now that space shuttle is retiring? Well, you heard a little bit about SpaceX and Orbital, we've had contracts and agreements in place with them for a few years now. SpaceX is uh, providing uh, their vehicles, they've done a demo already with their Dragon capsule, and they are planning to dock with station and lower cargo at the end of this year, in December. And Orbital uh, is also planning their dock to space station at the end of this year. Um, SpaceX can provide up to 6,000 kilograms of up mass and about 3,000 kilograms of down mass uh, for research. So we're not losing anything. Orbital can get you about 5,000 kilograms, roughly, up mass of cargo. Not just research, but cargo, replacement goods for, for crew. So we have our own two vehicles that are moving along quite well, commercial vehicles. Uh, not, not only that, but we will rely on our um, international partner vehicles, the ATV and the HTV as well, in the next few years. So that was number eight. Let's move on to number seven. Number seven, an overview of some of the STS-134 cool experiments. Um, the most obvious, alpha magnetic spectrometer. You guys, I think, are going to hear a lot about that in detail um, after me, and so I won't go into it too much. But if you're looking for philosophical reasons for uh, using space station or advancing space, this is one of them, right? This one, the one I find myself talking about, I freak out, because uh, we're talking about looking for dark matter, antimatter, and things, new matter, potentially new matter, called strangelets. That's stuff from like science fiction, right? So I can't wait to hear about it um, from, from uh, the AMS team sooner or later. But um, you yeah, guys, watch this one. Data's going to be collecting as soon as, I think, four days after it's installed on orbit. So this is a big one. This is a big piece of, of station right here. It's going to answer the origin, the questions about the origins of our universe. Cool. <laughs> uh, so cool. OK, second. <laughs> we are sending spiders on the space shuttle tomorrow to space station. I know, the scientists gave me this thing this morning when I was in the labs. They told me to take it. I have to bring it back alive. Hey, it's alive, folks, and I'll pass it around, but uh, please take care of them. It's a golden orb spider. He's enclosed. <laughs> oh, he's not gonna fly tomorrow. He's a replica. He's a buddy of, the, of those that are flying tomorrow. And uh, these guys are going up as part of something called CSI 05 experiment. Uh, it's an educational experiment where these golden orb spiders are going to be launched up, and they're going to uh, we're going to get video of them on space station about how they how they leave their web. And in fact, the video is going to come down to classrooms, and students across uh, the country are going to be able to run their own experiments with with the same type of spiders alongside of what's happening on space station, and compare their experiments to those that are happening in real time on orbit. If you go to bioedonline.com, bioed.online.com, there's way more information about this uh, really fantastic experiment. It's going to touch over 100,000 students. And uh, 
And uh, so yes, we are flying those spiders. This experiment's gonna run over 45 days. Not only will we look at the spider web development, we're gonna look at mo mobility of Drosophila. Those are fruit flies. Well, the fruit flies are food for the spiders. But, well, you know, we gotta make use of them somehow. Yes, they'll be eaten, but actually, we're gonna look at how they're gonna move in space. That hasn't actually been investigated fully before, their behavior. So fruit flies and spiders, and a third part of that experiment will be plant growth. And students will have access to seeing what's happening on orbit here. Um, one more experiment I want to mention about SPS 134 is the ELC-3. You've heard a lot about uh, it's flying, um, and it's, gonna on station, it's flying up the station and when it's installed on the external truss of station, it's going to carry a plasma detector. It's got a detector that's less than the size, the diameter of human hair. It's going to measure plasma fluctuations between the vehicle and the ionosphere, and it'll be able to um, run it through a detector that's less than one tenth of an inch thick, tiny, tiny things, and tell us about pretty much about what the uh, what the interaction of the vehicle and the ionosphere is uh, going on there, and so it helps tell us a little bit about how we should better operate our vehicles. Um, so that was number seven, the top, some of the cool experiments from 134. Now we get into some of the top experiments, some of the research results that we've seen already from station. First is, the so this is number six. First is regenerative environmental life support systems, water recycling, oxygen generation, carbon dioxide removal. You probably already know that's critical to life support in a closed environment of space. And the information that we gain from just using these types of equipment on space station has already benefited those of disaster relief zones. In particular, the resins that are used in the water recovery system on space station can, has been used in the ground during earthquakes and, and disaster zones uh, to clean the water without power or um, any extra uh, heavy equipment. So that's one. Number five, fluid flows in space. In microgravity, capillary fluids forces dominate. And controlling the flow of flu fluids in the absence of gravity is a challenge for designing spacecraft with the propellant, water, and recycling systems. In space, fluid actually climbs container walls, and it can hide in cracks and crevices. And so you can imagine what that must be like to try to design a, a propellant tank or a water recycling system around the behavior of fluids that has never before been modeled. So a couple of experiments have on orbit already been uh, performed that have actually developed a brand new fundamental universal equation for fluid behavior in space that's never been developed before. And the investigator for this has actually released uh, recently some open source code that allows the rest of us who are interested in um, understanding fluid flow behavior in space as well. So that's fundamental textbook knowledge gain. And it helps set up that those in space, but on Earth, that means something to us for designing things uh, that have to do with um, using.